our first speaker. A traditional part of our annual event has been to recognize individuals uh, who have made a special contribution to the struggle for uh, civil liberties in, in our community, in our state, in our country. Um, that's a tradition that this year has a very special character because we're going to honor uh, not an individual, but rather a group of individuals. I do want to say that it's really part of a great tradition. Uh, when one thinks back in American history, from the days of the Alien Sedition Act to the long years of struggle against slavery, the post-Civil War period of the Black Codes, the struggle for women's rights and full equality, and even the years that just in the recent past when we moved ahead, uh, the Civil Rights Revolution, the respect for individual choice, these long struggles have always been marked by the sacrifice and by the intense efforts of individuals who have faced difficulties in doing so. One thinks for a minute of the courage necessary to uh, jeopardize one's professional career or the problem that, that would occur as far as the economic security of the family for individuals who refuse to bow down to uh, laws that they believe to be unjust or regulations they believe to be violations of their privacy uh, and of their rights as individuals. Of course, I'm talking about the 28 members, neighbors of ours, uh, who have refused to sign and have challenged uh, the uh, regulations attempted, uh, that they have attempted to install in the Jet Propulsion Lab here in Pasadena. So it's with particular pleasure that I would like to welcome them to this gathering, and those of you who are members of that group, could you stand for a moment so we can welcome you collectively? We're proud to have you here, and we're happy to recognize the courage that you have demonstrated uh, during these past months as the legal struggle wears on. I want to introduce Robert Nelson to you, Bobby Nelson. Uh, Bobby has been a long-term friend of mine, uh, but he's also a distinguished scientist, uh, a leading scientific figure in the work that the JPL does, but also one who has never failed to speak out on the issues facing our society as a whole. Uh, now he speaks for a group of fellow scientists uh, people who have made the reputation and the extraordinary contribution to science that JPL has produced. And Bobby has been among those leading scientists. Uh, but I welcome him here today uh, to speak for the scientists, for his colleagues at JPL. Robert Nelson, Dr. Robert Nelson. In case there's anyone here today who doesn't know who Marvin Schachter is, let me make sure you understand that when you're in trouble in Pasadena, Marvin is the go-to guy. And Marvin's been the go-to guy for the 30 years that I've known him and has been of immense help to me on all kinds of problems and has been absolutely stunning in his outspoken support for people who are in need of help. Uh, what I wanted to just discuss a little bit with you today was what 28 of us did, and also recount to you a story with a little bit of some personal perspective. Uh, and I hope in the course of the afternoon you'll have a chance to get some of the personal perspectives of some of the other plaintiffs in this case who are different than me and share different views than I, have different views than I do, although we share some views in common. But the particular item that we're talking about today is these are 28 people who knew better and stood up to a management at JPL and Caltech, which manages JPL for NASA, at a time when that management also should have known better. There have been eight directors in the history of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. 
and I can state with fair confidence that at least two of them would not have, had not have passed the scrutiny that was being imposed on us by this background investigation. So if 25% of the previous directors of JPL have, would have a problem with this, why didn't our own management see the problem from the start? And that's the question and the gist of the remarks that I want to make. But what actually happened? What happened was three years ago, just normal business-like management, managers came to us and said, everyone's getting new identification badges. Well, these are nothing more than plastic identification badges that people wear at their workplace all the time. So what? Come in and get a new badge. Incidentally, JPL people who are plaintiffs in the case have a special badge that they've been wearing for the last three years, which is a little button that says no HSPD-12, and you'll see them wearing them today. Entirely innocuous. Come in and get your new badge. When we started investigating it further, there was something else that they said. You have to bring in, sign this paperwork and bring it in. There's nothing, just bring it in, sign it. The paperwork reads, I authorize investigators to understand, I understand I'm having a background investigation. I authorize investigators to look into all aspects of my background, up to and including, but not limited to, my academic residence, educational background, or anything else that the investigators might find of interest. <laughs> and I do this voluntarily. That was the crux of the problem. We said, this sounds like an open-ended fishing expedition. We've been taught, most of us have advanced degrees. <laughs> most of us publish papers in engineering and scientific journals of great excellence. We review manuscripts of colleagues. We know what it means to read what you sign. So something looked bad about it. And the idea of saying that this was voluntary was something that bothered us deeply and disturbed us. We went to management and management said, oh no, it's the law, you just have to do it, you have no choice. <laughs> well, first thing, lesson number one that we learned was if somebody tells you it's the law, you don't have to believe them. Find yourself a lawyer and ask your, and ask your own lawyer. Don't ask their lawyer to tell you what the, what's legal or not. And so I called up a local lawyer, a personal friend, a person who's handled many items with me, Marvin Rudnick. And Marvin and I had the first of what were to be many lunches in which we discussed this case. And Marvin taught me lesson number one. He said, what law? And I said, what do you mean? They told me it's the law. He said, ask him what law? Lesson number one, if somebody tells you you're required to do it by the law, ask them what law. I went back and said, well, what law is this? And they said, Homeland Security Presidential Directive number 12. Well, I didn't have to go quite back to Marvin immediately. I googled HSPD 12 and found out what it was. It's a document, you can see it's googled, it's right there, an executive order signed by President Bush in the wake of 9-11 which calls for a uniform standard for identification for access to all federal facilities. That's the intent of the directive. They want this badge, which lets me into JPL, to let me into any other NASA facility or any other federal facility. That's all that was asked for. There was nothing in the statement of HSPD-12 about a background investigation. I went back to Marvin and I said, well, this is HSPD-12. Marvin said, there's don't see anything about a background investigation. No. Well, how did this background investigation start? Well, in the fine print of the directive, it says the implementation is left to the Department of Commerce. So what happened? Unnamed bureaucrats buried in the bowels of the Department of Commerce conjured up this long and convoluted and very unconstitutional background investigation requirement, which they intended to lay on all federal employees. And the employees had to voluntarily agree to it, and if they didn't, they would be terminated from their jobs. No background check, you can't get on to lab. If you can't get on to lab, you can't do your work. I went back and had lunch with Marvin again. I said, well, we've talked to them about it. They're still telling us it's a law. He said, there's worse news for you. 
and he mentioned to me a case called Egan versus Navy. The case involved a security uh, clearance denial by a person with a classified record. In the Egan case, we learned that if you do have an adverse finding about you in these background investigations, you have no right to take this matter to court to seek redress. You are just through. I went back and I was talking to